way Busayadu was important for two reasons. One is that in his time, he became one of the most venerated monks in Burma. He was known as an arahant, a fully liberated person. And the second reason is that he was the person, the monk, who authorized Saiji Ubakin, Goenkaji's teacher, as a teacher. He gave Saiji that authorization and for a householder to be authorized by a monk of such standing, reputedly an arahant, known as an arahant, gave Saiji enormous status, prestige, and backing in his work. Had he been authorized by another householder teacher, it would have been okay. But nothing like this, nothing like Webu Sayadaw's. Not only authorization, but continuing support throughout his life. And as this talk goes on, we'll explore further that important relationship between Webu Sayadaw and Saiji Ubakin. Now firstly, to orient you. This is a map of Upper Burma, the Mandalay area, and three important places in the life of Webu Sayadaw, which I'll point out to you. The first is Injin Bin probably the most important place in his life. It's his own village of his birth. He was born there. He died there. His biggest monastery was there, and so many events in his life happened there. Really, it was his main center. The second place nearby is Shwebo, where he had another monastery. And the third place, very important for us in our tradition, is Chausi. It's it's spelt Kyokse, but pronounced Chause, and Chause is what I'll call it all the way through this talk. At the bottom of almost every slide, you'll see a quote. All these quotes are from Webu Sayadaw himself. They're taken from his discourses, and they're beautifully inspiring. He was born in 1896, so he's relatively modern, the son of quite a poor farmer, one of four children. And Injinbin is just a very little village, quite remote. We'll hear more about Injinbin later. An early example of his compassion, at the age of seven, he was sent by his father out into the fields to scare away the sparrows who were eating all his father's grain. And he refused. He said, no, they're hungry, that's why they're there, I'm not going to drive them away. So here's the son disobeying the father at the age of seven out of compassion for sparrows. He takes his robes as a salmonera at the age of nine, that's a novice, goes to the local monastery and gets his education, as was very traditional in those days in Burma, was taught to read, write, and so forth. At the age of 20, he ordains as a full monk, and then he goes off to Mandalay to the capital, the old royal capital, and he went to Masumain University, a monastic university, to study Pariyati. So he had a good education. Masumain was reputed to be probably the best monastery for the study of Pariyati at that time. And he spent all of two years there. And then he got fed up with it. He wasn't interested in Pariyati. He wanted to go out and practice what he'd been taught. So then, he more or less disappears from view for some years. He was in caves, he was in forests, meditating on his own. We really don't know where he was. One early little story, very early in this period, he had a lot of trouble with his stomach, with dysentery. And this was afflicting him, interrupting his meditation. He was traveling on a train one day, and someone heard about this, and said, oh, you should go to Chausi this place on the map, uh, there's a well there with water with medicinal properties. You should try that. And at the same time, he had a dream that someone was directing him there. So he went to Chausi, found the well, which is near the hills, called the Webula Hills. And as he approached, a being came up to him, offered him the water. It's a bluish water. This well is unusual. Sometimes the water is blue, sometimes white. He took the offering, and it is said that he never again got sick and never again lay down. As I said, he was 
known as an arahant and known for his unflagging diligence in his practice. He took the dutanga, the practice of meditating in only three postures, walking, sitting or standing, but never lying down. And it was said that he never slept. So after about four years, where no one knew where he was, he re-emerges again in Chausi. And a lay follower there, really impressed with this monk, with his noble bearing, said, oh, I want to build you a monastery. And Webu Sayadaw refused. He said, no thanks, I'd rather live in my cave. And then he relented. Out of compassion, he said, all right, you can build me a monastery, but it has to be built in one day. So the householder said, all right, got all his laborers there, would have been there very early in the morning, I suspect, all the materials, and that's it. That dark building, not the first one, which is the hut, but the dark building with the tin shed, that was Webu Sayadaw's one-day monastery in Chausi. Another story from Chausi, he was going on his arms rounds one day, and accidentally he put his foot in an animal trap. It closed on him, you can imagine the agony. He didn't want to break the trap, because that would be breaking someone else's possession against his vineyard. So he just stood there, with his foot in the trap, bleeding, until about midday when the hunter came along. The hunter saw this and was so shocked that he swore never to hunt again. Now, as you know, he was born in Injinbin, that's where his family came from. While he'd been away in the forest, his mother had passed away, she died. But his father discovered he was in Chausi, came down, and begged him to return to Injin Bin to his family home. And Webu Sayadaw refused. He said, no thanks, I'm, I'm here, I'm happy. So the father had to go all the way back to Injin Bin, helpless. And when he came back, the father discovered that his own sister, that's Webu Sayadaw's aunt, was now also deathly ill and asking to see Webu Sayadaw. So, the father goes back, all the way back to Ebu Saidor and says, look, now your aunt is really ill, she's wanting to see you. He's imploring him, please come back. And Ebu Saidor says, all right, but on one condition. And the condition is that you, my father, ordain as a monk. And that's what happened. And I love this photo. There's Ebu Saidor on the left. There's his father on the right, both meditating together, no doubt observing their breath. Now, when he returned to Injinbin, he met his old childhood teacher, the one who taught him when he first ordained. And his teacher cross-questioned him about what he was doing. And he said, well, you taught me. I'm practicing what you taught me. And he explained Anapana to him. And then he said these words. This is the shortcut to Nibbana. Anyone can use it, stands up to investigation. It's in accordance with the teachings of the Buddha, as preserved in the scriptures. It's the straight path to Nibbana. And his teacher asked him to start teaching, which he did. And then there were two monasteries at Injin Bin, the one where his old teacher was teaching Pariyati, that's the study of the scriptures, and he was teaching Patipati on the other side. Of course, at that time, Injin Bin was a very small place. And then a third monastery was donated to him, that was in Shuibo, which I've pointed out. And he used to spend, he had a sort of rotation. He would spend the hot season at Injin Bin, the winter at Chausi, and the rainy season at Shuibo. And he spent 37 rainy seasons at Shuibo. And here he is sweeping the grounds. Now, I've mentioned that he was an arahant. And of course, we have Goenkaji's advice that Anapana is not sufficient to take out your impurities. So a lot of questions come, how come? How could he become an arahant just doing anapana? And this is the answer, and this is a quote from one of his own writings or discourses. And you'll see how, although he starts with anapana and emphasizes it, the whole progress of the technique is actually in this. You start with the breath, but then you notice sensation in this area, just as Goenkaji teaches on day three of a course. And you notice the changing process, appearance and disappearance. So Anicca is in there already. And with concentrated insight, 
that develops. And then the concentration spreads through the body. Goenkaji talks about the stage of Bhanga being absolutely essential to move from there to Nibbana, and here it is. The meditator becomes aware of swiftly sweeping changes. There's our sweeping all over the body. And then you get the continuity. The mindfulness develops day by day. Penetrating insight happens. And then, of course, the dip, the Nibbanic dip. So there it all is in a nutshell. And the only difference really is the starting point and the emphasis that Webu Saidor personally and particularly gave on Anapana all the way through, which is a perfectly acceptable way of working uh, described in the Satipatthana Sutta. Something Webu Saidor was also known for was his humility, his sense of humor, and his kindness. He was a very... His discourses are very, very simple. They use homely examples, perfect for the audience he had at that time, which were poor, rural, uneducated people mostly. And here you see him in the first monastery at Injinbin. And here he is using a very homely example. He's sitting under a roof and he's saying, well, if your practice is perfect, your roof won't leak. Now, there are many lovely interactions between him and his audience. Just one I'll quote you. He's talking to a fellow and he says, oh, do you practice the Upasat days? You know what the Upasat days are? Every month you go out, you go to a quiet place, you practice. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, we do the Upasat day. Oh, yes, and what do you do? Oh, well, I, my wife comes with me, sir, and we take a picnic. Oh, and then what do you do? Well, we eat the picnic, sir, and it's a big meal. And sometimes we go beyond midday, uh, but we're told that's permitted. Oh, yes. And then what do you do? Oh, well, after the picnic, sir, I usually feel very sleepy, so I lie down and I have a sleep. Oh, and then what do you do? Oh, well, when I wake up, usually I feel quite ill, and so I have some lemonade. And do you share this lemonade with others? Oh, no, sir, I drink it all myself. And is there a lot of it? Yes, there's a lot of it. And after that, I often feel even more ill. And then he says, and then what do you do? We go home. <laughs> and then he says, well, do you think that your lack of progress is because the Buddha wasn't really enlightened or taught wrongly? Or do you think there's something wrong in your practice? And there are many, many lovely stories like that. Here's another beautiful homely example. He's talking about continuity here. And of course, by that time, the British were in control of Burma. They'd put in a railway system. And he's giving the example of a train. And this is the continuity. If you're fed up and bored, don't leave. If you're enjoying yourself, don't leave. If you're ill, stay there. If you're strong and healthy, stay there. If you have plenty of company, stay there. If you're all on your own, don't leave. If people say unpleasant things, don't leave. If they speak to you respectfully, don't get off your train. In other words, keep the continuity all the way through. And so Webu Sayadaw had this system of going around his three monasteries. And now we're going to fast forward to 1941. The Second World War has started. The Japanese are about to invade Burma. And at that time, Uba Kin was the accountant for the railways board. And he used to go up and down on the main line between Mandalay and Rangoon, auditing the railway stations. He had a special carriage because he was the chief accountant, and it was all fitted out for him. He could sleep in his carriage, and which meant that he could go for quite long trips at a time. And he arrives at a station near Chausi to audit the accounts and discovers that the accounts are already audited. So he's got two or three spare days. So he's shunted off into Chausi on a, si on a siding there, and now he's thinking what to do. So he goes out, and there's a hill nearby with a pagoda on it. So he climbs up the hill to the pagoda. It seems to beckon him in some way. Um, and he's with the assistant station master. They go to the top of the hill, and from the top, they notice below, at the foot of the hills, um, a bamboo monastery, a very small bamboo monastery. And Ubar Kin says, what's that? And the assistant station master says, oh, that is the monastery of a very highly developed monk. These are the Weibu hills, so they call him Weibu Sayadaw. He's worthy of paying respects to, sir. He's an arahant. 
And Ubar Kin was thrilled. And he wanted to go straight away, so he starts off down the hill. And the station master says, no, 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 no. He doesn't take people now. He doesn't receive people in the morning. You'll have to wait till the afternoon. So Ubar Kin goes back, has his lunch, goes to his carriage, meditates, and sends metta to this monk and mentally requests him to be able to come and pay respects. And then he sets off with the assistant station master. They arrive about three in the afternoon. There's no one there. Just an old lady, an old nun, pounding chilies. And Ubar Kin says, well, we, we would like to come and pay respects to Webusa at all. And she says, oh, he won't, he won't see you now. He won't come out till 6 p.m. He's meditating. And Ubar Kin says, well, I've come all the way from Rangoon, and I would really like to make some contact with him. May I at least go and pay respects outside his hut? And she says, yes, sure, you can do that. And this is the hut, a little bamboo hut, which was next to his one-day monastery. And so Ubar Kin goes, kneels on the ground, and pays respects. And at that moment, the door of the hut opens. Out comes Webu Saido, preceded by a large cloud of mosquitoes. And Webu Saido says, his first words, O oh, great disciple, when you pay respects, what is your aspiration? And before Ubar Kin can reply, Webu Saido continues, Oh, it's Nibbana. You want Nibbana, do you? And how will you get that? So he's reading Ubar Kin's mind. And Ubar Kin says, Sir, the way to Nibbana is with the knowledge gained by Vipassana, by Panya. And even now, I'm directing my attention to my body with the understanding of Anicca. And Webu Sadhu says, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. And where did you learn this technique? And he cross-questions him for a long time. And Ubar Kin relates that he'd taken his first course with Sayataji, and that since then he'd been practicing diligently. Even in his carriage, he practiced daily. And they had a long conversation. Normally, Webu Saido didn't talk much. Uh, but people around him said they'd never seen him talk as much as he did to Ubar Kin. So, and at the end of it, he says, well, you must have great paramis, because I thought that you had been in the jungle practicing for many years. Ubar Kin says, well, may I bring you your breakfast tomorrow? So that was arranged. Again, breakfast the next day, long talks again. And at the end of it, Webu Saido says these words which are quoted here. He authorizes him as a teacher. Great disciple, you have to give the Dhamma, share the Dhamma with everyone. You cannot be sure that you will again meet the disciples that are with you now. Now you've met them, give them Dhamma, show them Dhamma to some small extent. Give them Dhamma, don't wait. And he didn't. When Ubar Kin got back to his train, his first pupil was the assistant station master, right there in his carriage. Another quote from Webu Saido, and here again we see that this Anapan that he was practicing also included sensation, and very subtle sensation. In a split second, matter arises and dissolves billions and billions of times. Don't go around asking others. Just keep your attention there, and you'll find out for yourself. And so, for the next few years, he's doing his round. The Japanese invade. It doesn't really affect him very much. And then the British bomb Burma heavily. Uh, they return. doesn't affect him very much. He just continues. And then there's Burmese independence. And now we fast forward to 1953. Burma's independent at this stage, and a lot of trouble in Burma. Civil commotions, uprising, riots, everything seems to be going wrong. And the people of that time, the high politicians and so forth, had this belief, which is a common belief in Asian countries, that when you've got these kinds of troubles, if you invite a saintly person or some saintly people to the capital and ask them to give metta, to give discourses, the troubles will die down, they'll cease. And Ubar Kin felt very strongly that this person, Webu Saido, should be invited. And so he invites him. He sends one of his accountant general staff as a messenger all the way up to Mandalay, doesn't bother to give him a letter, 
just asks him to make a verbal invitation and says to the messenger, and I will also invite him from Rangoon. So the messenger arrives in Mandalay, and he stays with a friend of his overnight, and the friend says, what are you doing up here? And he explains his mission, and the friend laughs at him, he scoffs. He says, you must be joking. Webu Sayadaw has never spent even one night outside his monasteries. He never even goes to Mandalay, and you think he's going to come down to your place in Rangoon? Forget it. The messenger persists. He goes to the little bamboo monastery, and Webu Sayadaw is eating his lunch. And he says, sir, I've been sent by Uba Kin, uh, your former student down, from down in Rangoon. And Webu Sayadaw says, yes, yes, as if he knew. And lunch was taken, and then the messenger delivers his message. He explains how Uba Kin, following Webu Sayadaw's authorization, had founded a center, International Meditation Center in Rangoon, IMC, and he was teaching both Burmese and foreigners. He was teaching them Vipassana. All this time, Webu Sayadaw just listens quietly and smiles. And then the messenger delivers his message. And he says, sir, your paramis are so great. And the people in this northern part of Burma are so few. Please come down. The people of the southern Burma need you. The people in Rangoon need you. Please come down. Give your metta and your instructions there. And Sayaji invites you to stay at his center for seven days at IMC. And all the people around look shocked. There's a, there's a silence. Because not only has Webu Sayadaw never accepted any invitation like that before, but it's also very unusual at that time for a monk to spend any time at the center of a householder. That was almost shocking in itself. And so there's this great silence. The messenger wipes his brow and waits. And then Webu Sayadaw calmly says, well, I think tomorrow would be too soon. If we come the day after tomorrow, would that be all right? Would that suit you? You can imagine the messenger's shock, and everybody was just astonished. Uh, the messenger rushes off, phones Yuba Kin, who buys the plane tickets. Webu Sayadaw comes down with six monks and two assistants. Yuba Kin pays all the, play all the tickets down. And then later it transpired that Yuba Kin had already mentally invited Webu Sayadaw, even before the messenger reached there. And Webu Sayadaw had already mentally accepted. And someone later on discovered this and said to Webu Saido, is this possible? And he said, yes, when the minds are pure enough, that is possible. And we'll come across this person in a minute again. So he arrives at Yangon Airport. Uh, Ubakin meets him with a car, drives him to IMC. As one commentator put it, he hopped out of the car, looks up at the, the T, which is the umbrella, the crown of the pagoda, which was all gleaming gold and new pays respects, walks up the stairs, and circumambulates with Ubakin three times around the pagoda. And here he is doing it. Ubakin in front, Webu Sayadaw behind. You might also notice the small man on Webu Sayadaw's left will come across him later too. Ubakin then invites him into the central cell to sit down and gives a little talk about what he's been doing at IMC, how he's been teaching foreigners, how he's been teaching Vipassana and the Burmese. And Webu Sayadaw smiles, looks very pleased. Uba Kin then invites him to give Dhamma. He gives the precepts to meditators who are seated all around in the cells, all around that central cell, and he gives a discourse. And then after that, all the leading lights of Burmese society start coming in big numbers over those next seven days. And he's busy every day with big crowds coming to meet him, to take Dhamma from him, and sometimes just even to see him, because by now he's becoming famous. Now, one person who was particularly impressed was this man, So Shwetaik. Now, this man was the person who asked Webu Sayadaw if the invitation could be mental. Now, he was the first president of Burma. He was the one Goenkaji talks about in his Day 6 discourse, 
the one who ruined his own feast, uh, the alcoholic. He's now no longer president of Burma. He's an ex-president now, but still in Rangoon. And he was actually a, one of the chief princes of the Shan states up north in Burma. And he's very impressed with Wei Saido, and, he, and he's off to, guess what, a party. He's off to a diplomatic party that night, but he thinks he'll drop in on IMC on the way and listen to a discourse. So he and his wife rock up at IMC. They listen to the discourse. He's very impressed. And then he says to Wei Saido, does Uba Kin teach the same as you? And Wei Saido says, oh, yes, he teaches the same as me. You should study under him. And Saw Shui Taik turns around to Uba Kin and says, oh, well, you must teach me some time. And Uba Kin says, why, wait, I'll take you to a cell right now. Now, Saw Shui Taik was very worried about being late for his diplomatic party, but he was caught. He couldn't refuse in front of Wei Bu Saido, so he was led off to a cell by Uba Kin, protesting all the way and muttering about how he was going to be late for his party. So he's given Anapana, and he goes, goes into such a peaceful state, he doesn't open his eyes for two hours. Finally, Uba Kin knocks on the door and says, it's 9 p.m., you're late for your party. And he decides to skip the party. Later, as we know, he took a course, and we know all about that course from Govindaji's description, and he became a very devoted student, and one of the, probably the chief organizer of Weibu Sayadaw's tours down south. Because after this initial visit, Weibu Sayadaw pretty much every year came down south to Rangoon and touring around. And here's one photograph from that time. You can just see the size of the crowds. Uh, this is just going from one Burmese village to another on his arms round. And in front of him, you'll see a figure in white carrying his bow. That is Saw Shui Taik. And so he was the chief organizer for many, many years. Now, previously, I mentioned or you to note a person walking on Weibu Sayadaw's left when he first came to IMC. His name was U Tain Nyunt, and here he is walking behind Weibu Sayadaw here. He was also enormously impressed when Weibu Sayadaw came down, and he was another accountant in the railway department, so he knew Uba Kin. And he decided that he would become Weibu Saido's Kapia, that's his personal assistant. Every time Weibu Saido came south, Uten Nyunt would be there, would be looking after him. And there are many, many photos, videos of Weibu Saido, and in so many of them, you'll see this man, Uten Nyunt. And then the next question that comes is, was he a meditator? Well, he wasn't at that stage. He had a problem. He had an alcohol problem just like Saw Shui Taik. And he didn't want to give up his alcohol, and therefore he resisted doing a course. And Saiji talked to him so many times. Uten Nyun's sister lived next door to Saiji, so he knew him well, and Saiji would often say, oh, you must do a course, you must do a course. And he resisted and resisted and resisted. But finally, we know he did, because there's a photograph of a group of students at IMC after a course, and he's among them. So he got his dammer in the end, but in the meantime, he was extraordinarily devoted to Weibu Saidor. Almost everywhere Weibu Saidor goes in the south, you'll see this man, Uten Nyunt, with him. Now, here he is here, and these arms rounds were quite a performance. Everybody wanted to get the merit of giving dana, of giving food to an arahant. And quite often at his meals, there'd be 200 dishes. Now, how do you deal with that? And it would take a long time because he would take a tiny spoon or just a little on, the th on your thumbnail from each dish just so that everyone could have the merit. And it took such a long time that people would... Uh, they, tr they looked for some solution. And in the end, what they did was they took all the dishes which were similar, mixed them all up and got down to a few dishes. And then he'd take a spoonful or so from each dish. So that's how they managed. But you can see here, uh, here is Uten Nyunt with a great big basket. 
and people are putting, thing, putting things into Webu Sayadaw's bowl, and then Ute Nyun would take them out of the bowl, put them into his basket, so that there was room in the bowl for the next person. And this would go on sometimes for hours. And there'd be not only food, but other kinds of gifts as well. Robes, all the requisites of a monk, and the moment he had them, he would usually allocate them to some other monastery, to some other group of monks. So this was a regular thing. Here's a photo I love. It's Webu Sadol relaxing over a cup of tea, and Uche Nyont is pouring his tea. Another photo I like very much. Webu Sadol encouraged Dana because of the merit it gave. And the body language here is just so beautiful with this man giving something, I can't even see what it is, and Webu or accepting it. And he's encouraging it because of the merit it gives you when you donate. Now, this is Webu Sayadaw with a car. It's a Dodge Plymouth. And there's a story behind this. A young American lady called Clarissa Vanstrong came out and took robes, first in Singapore under another monk and then later under Webu Sayadaw, and stayed for three years and practiced very seriously. But her father didn't like it. He thought, oh, she's getting involved in some sect, some weird Eastern religion or something. So he came all the way out to Burma to bring her back to America which he did. But she was unhappy about this, and a deal was done. She would come back to America, to San Francisco, if the father paid for this Dodge Plymouth to be sent out as a donation to Webu Saido. And that's what happened, and there he is with his Dodge Plymouth. And that car got heavy use. You'll see many photographs of him. He'd be driven to some place to do his arms round. Uh, and the shipping was arranged by, guess who? Ute Nyunt, who was the railway accountant. And the car, when it came out, was designated only two people could use it. One was Webu Saidor, and the other one was Unu, who was the Prime Minister of Burma at that time, that Dhamma Prime Minister who permitted Saiji to give courses in his office. So just two people could use it. Of course he had a chauffeur. I'm sure he didn't drive it himself. <laughs> Now, on his trips down south, on one occasion, he did a tour of India, a pilgrimage to India. So here we are at Bodh Gaya. And here he is. Can anybody tell me where he is? Under the Bodhi tree at Bodh Gaya, yes. And he did a very full, conventional pilgrimage tour. Uh, all the usual places, Bodh Gaya and Sarnath and Nalanda and, and so on and so forth. It was a, it was a full good pilgrimage and Ute Nyunt was with him all the way. And he didn't just stop at doing a pilgrimage. Here he is doing the tourist thing. He's in front of the Taj Mahal in India with Ute Nyunt. So he took some time off to see some of the sites as well. Here he is at Kushinagar, where the Buddha died, paying respects to the place where the Buddha died. Again, I think that's a beautiful photo. Now, apart from India, he also went to Sri Lanka. And again, there's a story behind that. There was a monk called U Lokanata, an Italian, came out from Europe, took robes, and for some time studied under Webu Saido at Injinbin and became quite famous in his own right. There's even photos of him with Hollywood celebrities and things like that back in America. But he, but he came back through Sri Lanka and he knew the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka and he was talking to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister was lamenting the fact that there were no fully enlightened beings in the world today. And Ulo Kanata said, oh no, that's not true, and told him about Webu Sayadaw. And the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka was thrilled. 
And so he invited Webu Sayadaw out on a state visit. Big thing. Webu Sayadaw came, and here he is in the house uh, of, I think it's the prime minister of that time. And that person next to him, on Webu Sayadaw's left, the slightly roly-poly looking figure, is Ulo Kanata, the Italian monk. When he went there, the Prime Minister also presented him with some genuine Buddha relics, which he was very pleased with. He took them back to Injin Bin, and they're still there today. So if you ever take a pilgrimage to Injin Bin, be sure to try to meditate with the Buddha relics. Another photo from Sri Lanka. Here is a lady offering him something, probably robes. And Ute Nyund in the background, looking quite seraphic. And here he is talking about sensation. Now back to Injin Bin. He was spending a lot of time here. He was now famous. And what had become a small monastery was getting bigger and bigger. Today it covers 33 acres. There are many, many buildings, probably a hundred buildings there, and people kept on building more, building more. Uh, monasteries, dam uh, accommodation, dam halls, all kinds of things. And he'd give a discourse almost every night, and there'd be something like 300 people at this discourse quite often. And they would be Asian heads of state, leaders of Burmese society, all kinds of people. He was now very, very popular. He'd get up in his typical days, he'd get up in the morning quite early, go round the compound, giving instructions to the meditators. He'd then start on his arms round about eight or seven o'clock in the morning to avoid the heat of the day. And that would sometimes take three or four hours because everybody wanted to, to donate to feed him. Come back, have his lunch, give a discourse, sweep the compound and rest in the afternoon, another discourse in the evening, again with many, many people, and then he'd retire for the night. And that was daily routine. Now one day, a young man came to him and said, Sir, how did you get enlightened and where did you get enlightened? And there was no answer. The young man went away. And later, Webu Saido called the young man's father and said, I want you to build a lake, a pond, in this particular place, and he noted the place, and you can call it the Lake of Victory. And so this was built, and then Webu Sayadaw said, that is the answer to your son's question. And that lake is opposite his meditation hut. Now Webu Sayadaw, I've mentioned he gave many discourses. When he was down on tour in the south especially, he'd give sometimes five or 10 discourses every day a Burmese scholar collected many of these discourses. Quite a few have been translated, you can get them. And said that Webu Sayadaw, in all his discourses, they were very simple discourses, homely discourses, but he always made seven points, these same seven points. And if he gave 10,000 discourses in his life, he would have made those same seven points 10,000 times. And here they are. Firstly, a huge emphasis on Sheila. If you want to be perfect, if you want to fulfill your aspirations, you have to be perfect in Sheila. And secondly, when practicing dana, when you're giving, what's most important is your volition, not how much you give. And thirdly, always act with an upright mind because of the law of karma. If you don't act with an upright mind, your karma will come back and bite you. Not his words. <laughs> And then he said, aspire only to Nibbana. Don't aspire to any happiness, human or celestial. Only go for Nibbana, because anything else is impermanent. And he points out that we're now in a Buddha sasana, and now we can practice wisdom, proper panya, which is only possible in a Buddha sasana, and so we can benefit so very much. And then from birth to death, we always have the in-breath and the out-breath, exactly as Goenkaji says in the Anapana instructions. And when doing anything at all, sitting, standing, lying, walking, whatever it is, 
always be aware of the breath. And that was continuous. As I've said, in Jinbin became quite a place where many people went. And at one time, Sayaji, who all this time had been teaching, and Webu Sayadaw had been visiting him regularly at IMC, Sayaji decided that he wanted to become a monk and do a retreat for seven days. And he didn't want any fuss, because he knew that a lot of people would want to give him robes or this or that. So he just went off secretly, just got in his car, drove up to Mandalay, and went and visited his old friend, Uko Le. Uko Le was the vice-chancellor of Mandalay University. And he arrives at the door, and Uko Le says, what are you doing here? And he says, oh, I've come to take robes. Would you like to as well? And Uko Le rushes around and gets himself organized, and they go off to Webu Sayadaw and present themselves to him. And he says, oh, so you want to do good deeds, do you? And they said, yes, sir. And he says, well, if you want to become a monk, there are 227 precepts. Do you know them? Oh, no, sir, we don't know what they are. He says, well, all of them are to restrain your acts of body, speech, and mind. And I'll give you a technique whereby you can do that. And he teaches the Anapana. And then he says, and when you're doing Anapana, when you're following the in-breath and the out-breath, are you doing any physical misdeeds? No, sir. Are you doing any vocal misdeeds? No, sir. And when you control your mind, are you doing any mental misdeeds? No, sir. He says, all right, well, this is what you have to practice, and then you don't have to worry about knowing those 227 precepts. And then he looks at them and he says, well, you're both over 50, and you've probably slept every single night of your life. Oh, yes, sir. And he says, well, have you come here to make merits or not? Oh, yes, we've come to make merits, sir. And he says, well, you will do this the whole night. And so that was their retreat. And this is a photo of Webu Sayadaw in front, Saiji behind him, and Uko Le behind him at Injinbin. As I said, Webu Sayadaw used to visit Saiji's center, IMC, every time he came down to Rangoon. And he'd often stay there for a few days. He'd meditate with the students, give discourses. This is a very famous photograph of, taken by a Western meditator of Sayaji paying respects to Webu Sayadaw. And just have a look at this quote, which was given at IMC. This is the perfect place. This is a nucleus. Originally, he said it was like a jungle. But now, this is the perfect place, and it's the first center of many. So there's a prediction, and of course today, we have over 150 centers. Eventually, Sayaji passed away, before Webu Sayadaw did. And Webu Sayadaw went down, and he met a group of Sayaji's old students. And this is what he said. He never died. A person like your Sayaji will not die. You may not see him, but his teaching lives on. Not like some persons who, even though they're alive, are as if dead, who serve no purpose and who benefit none. Now, by this time, we're now in, quite late on, we're now about 1970 or so, later than that, 1976. Goenkaji's out teaching in the West, in India, and he's getting Western students, and he's sending them over to IMC. And groups of Western students are coming and sitting at IMC doing retreats. Sayaji's not there anymore, but they're still doing retreats. And one group of students had the good fortune to meet Webu Sayadaw. They were doing their retreat, and suddenly they were told, oh, there's a very important monk in town. You must come and see him. So they're all shipped off in a bus and taken to some dhamma hall somewhere. And they notice the place is packed with Burmese, all looking terribly smart. And there's Webu Sayadaw at the end with this huge meal in front of him, usual story. And he takes his meal, and they sit there. And then they take into, into a private room, and one of the happy group who met him was Bill Gracilius, who's an American teacher today. And 
This is Bill's description. He said the atmosphere was incredibly light in, and informal. Webu Saido was talking in Burmese and there was a translator and Uten Yunt was there as well. And he asked where they'd come from and they said they'd all these different places, America and Europe and this and that, Australia, whatever. And he was very impressed. He said, oh, this is like the time of the Buddha. You know, people come from such long distances just to practice, just to get the Dhamma. And there might be another person who lives across the street from a center and never practices. Obviously, you've got good paramis, very strong paramis. And he was very impressed. Bill's memory of it was this stillness in him. His hands never moved. There was no trace of any agitation whatsoever. And he talked about nothing but Dhamma. The whole group came away extraordinarily impressed. Now, part of the conversation was this. Webu Saido said, and how is your sati? How is your awareness? And the student said, oh, it's like a candle, a flame in a windy room. It's restless all the time. It never shifts. And so he says, if you stay in an enclosed place where the breeze can't get in, will the flame flicker? You must stay in a place where that's not possible. And where can we find such a place? Virya, effort. That's all he said. And this, I'm told, was a photograph of his last meal. He's now very old, and he's staying at Injinbin, and he passed away in June 1977 at the age of 81. And this is what Goenkaji said about him that year after he passed away. Recently, Venerable Bhikkhu Sayadaw passed away. He was an arahant. His teaching was such that he would just teach Anapana, nothing else. He would just say, observe the breath coming in, going out, and then you start getting sensations. And then the stage comes when the sensation automatically spreads, just as Webu Sayadaw described. It spreads to the whole body, the gross sensation passes, the subtle comes, you reach Bhanga. And then this Anapana technique, you giving importance to the breath right up to the end, up to the Nibbanic stage. So that's how Goenkaji explains it. And then finally, a quote from Webu Sayadaw himself. The benefits from the practice are not just for a short moment or a lifetime. That short moment of purity will bring benefits for the remainder of the cycle of birth and death. And why can you accomplish this? Because the time is right, your form of existence is right, and you're putting forth right effort. Exactly as the Buddha described, it's rare to come across a Buddha, it's rare to be a human being, it's rare to be able to make this effort. And he goes on, the disciples of the Buddha took practice from the teacher and worked with unwavering perseverance. Therefore, they achieved the awakening they despaired for. How did they work? In the same way, and another beautiful homely simile, as a man who wants to light a fire with a fire stick. They rub two pieces of wood together, and heat is produced. Eventually, the wood starts to glow, and then they could light a fire. And that's the continuity. <laughs>